the River Tees. Like all rivers, it starts at the top of a hill as a raindrop. But not just any old hill. It's the highest in England's Pennines, Cross Fell, at 2,930 feet. Our humble raindrop obeys the laws of gravity along with millions of others and begins to form a stream and flow towards the bottom of the hill, just like any other stream would. Eventually, as the topography of the landscape dictates, many other streams join our little stream. And before you know it, you have a river. But not this time. Back in the 1960s, huge industries were being developed around the mouth of the River Tees, which would devour huge quantities of water. As the immediate catchment area was so huge, the water authorities built a huge reservoir almost at the source of this great river at Cal Green. So, before our little stream can join any others, it flows straight into this huge man-made lake. I suppose after many weeks sloshing around in this lake, our little raindrop bypasses the stream stage and the River Tees is born as a huge volume of water flowing beneath the austere dam wall as a fully-fledged river. And what an entrance! After only a few hundred yards, the River Tees cascades down a spectacular rock face, ominously called Cauldron Snout. In a series of steps and cataracts, the river falls for over 200 feet to the valley, where it meets the Maze Beck flowing in from a side valley. The Pennine Way follows the banks of the Tees all the way down to Middleton in Teesdale. At the top of Cauldron Snout, it heads west to Cumbria, up onto the high fells and the endless punishing miles of peat bog, striking fear into the hearts of thousands of hikers who tread this way, as the map describes this section as Pennine Way Undefined Danger Area. It's often shrouded in cloud and penetrating wet mist. The section of the Pennine Way by the river, as it heads east below Cauldron Snout, is equally difficult and carries no warning whatsoever. But, as any hiker will tell you, Falcon Clints is every bit as difficult, especially when wet. Both the river and the footpath tumble over slippery boulders at the bottom of a huge scree slope, for the best part of half a mile or so.
We'll rejoin the river a few miles east at Cronkley Farm, where a fairly modern bridge was built when the reservoir was constructed, as the river was often too full to ford. Pennine Way also crosses to the south bank at this point. The dale is wide and open here, with many hill farms dotting the landscape, painted in their characteristic whitewash, as most belong to the Raby Estates. In late spring, the meadows are ablaze with wildflowers. Around Cow Green, you can find the tiny pansies and cotton grass of the high moors. and in the grassy meadows, millions of bright yellow buttercups. Our river once again retreats into the hills as it's flanked by the dark, ominous windstone rocks and is difficult to follow on foot. Even the Pennine Way veers south away from the torrent for a mile or so. Teesdale can be enjoyed at any time of the year, but in winter it's at its most dramatic. Snow is almost guaranteed at this elevation for many weeks. But sometimes it's just the long periods of sub-zero temperatures that make England's highest waterfall even more dramatic than it already is. This is high force. Here the River Tees plunges over a vertical cliff for over 70 feet into a rocky gorge, flanked by high vertical columns of windstone lying on softer limestone. With centuries of harsh winter temperatures and the sheer force of the river, the water slowly scours its way back into the rocks, forming this great natural stone amphitheatre with the waterfall centre stage. Let there be no mistake. This waterfall has to be treated with great respect. Many have died trying to climb the surrounding cliffs or thinking they can swim down it. But many have just lost their footing on the slippery rocks above and have gone in, swept over the lip to fall 70 feet into the icy cold cauldron at its foot. This waterfall is to be admired and respected at a safe distance. Following the Pennine Way is by far the best way to enjoy this spectacular section of river, as after a short distance you encounter the slightly less dramatic, but equally spectacular, waterfalls of low force. Here the waterfalls are not as high, but in full flood can look a spectacular sight. In summer, with less water flowing, you have an almost perfect picnic spot. And if you're motoring, a great place to park the car is the nearby small hamlet of Bowlees. Bowlees Visitor Centre, run by the North Pennines area of outstanding natural beauty, is where you can learn a little bit of the history of the Dale and its past industries and lead mining. Alternatively, you can just enjoy the tranquility of the woodland and its flora and fauna.
but don't leave here without a little walk up to Summerhill Force, a beautiful waterfall just a short stroll from the car park. In summer, the flow is but a trickle, and the lush, shady trees create wonderfully dappled sunlight. But after winter storms, the scene changes dramatically. And back upstream, High Force lives up to its name, as millions of gallons of flood water plunge over the surrounding vertical cliffs. For those of you who like to walk, then take the path down the meadow across the small suspension bridge over the falls, and you're back on the Pennine Way. To see the best vantage point of High Force, turn west. But alternatively, you can turn east and enjoy the undulating part of the Pennine Way, which hugs the banks of the River Tees down to the principal village of the Dale, Middleton in Teesdale. At Middleton you can relax and find some nice tea shops, or something stronger in the local hostelries. In summer, market stalls and shops are full of local produce, as well as craft stalls which line the wide verges of this beautiful village. But when the sun shines in mid-October, Middleton is ablaze with autumnal colours. When the summer visitors have gone, you can wander unobstructed at your own pace and enjoy this unique Dales village in England's last wilderness. When heading out of Middleton, many take the main road to Barnard Castle. But there's another way, which takes in some more breathtaking scenery and some of the most unspoilt villages in County Durham. Shortly after passing through Mickleton, take a right turn signposted to Grassholm Reservoir and Nature Reserve, and you'll soon find yourself in remote, wild, high pasture land, with splendid views back over Teesdale. A little further on, there's a small car park at the head of Grassholm Reservoir, and here the call of the curlew and lapwing are carried on the breeze, a breeze which never seems to drop. It's a peaceful and tranquil place to walk, or just chill out and enjoy a picnic. Shortly after rejoining the low road to Barnard Castle, Romald Kirk is one of the many villages you'll encounter. Its village green comes alive with spring daffodils, and its historic church, St Romald's, 
is just one of its pleasant picturesque features. The nave dates back to 1155 AD and it's known as the Cathedral of the Dale. And, as you'd expect, the scene wouldn't be complete without a couple of local hostelries, the Kirk Inn and the Rose and Crown. That's where you can find a pleasant meal and a bed for the night. On the village green are reminders of the past, with a set of stocks to calm down the unruly peasants, and an old stone trough and hand pump for your thirsty horse. It dates back to the 16th century, but most of the buildings are from the 17th. In 1644, two thirds of the population of Ronald Kirk died in the Great Plague. But now, a large proportion of Ronald Kirk's residents are retired people, enjoying this little jewel in the northern fells. The Dale is home to many upland farms, which are principally sheepsteads. In early spring the ewes are brought down to lower pastures in time for the lambing season. Always good entertainment for visitors, but you do wonder how something so cute can grow up into something apparently so stupid. As you get closer to Barney, as the locals call it, you can't fail to see the imposing structure built on a high cliff above the river, strategically giving a commanding view of the dale. This is the town's namesake, Barnard Castle. Dating back to the 10th century, it was built by Guy de Balliol and has a rich history. The structure was further fortified and enlarged by his nephew Bernard de Balliol between 1125 and 1185 AD. Hence the name, Barnard's or Bernard's Castle. But in 1216 the castle was besieged by Alexander, the second king of Scotland, and in the ensuing centuries its ownership passed on and around several kings and bishops. Notably, in 1477, Richard III took possession of it and it became his favourite residence. After Richard's death, the castle and estate were owned by several generations of the Nevilles, until 1626 when it was sold to Sir Henry Vane. But Sir Henry decided that nearby Raby Castle would be his principal residence, and Barnard Castle was left abandoned. The castle is now a Grade I listed structure by English Heritage, and it's open to the public, whilst Lord Barnard lives at Raby, and much of Teesdale is part of the Raby Estates. Barnard Castle is a thriving market town and is busy all the year round. But in springtime and early summer, thousands of tourists flock to Barney to enjoy the wonderful atmosphere and farmer's market, with its traditional live folk music and dancing in the wide market street, with its imposing architecture leading you down to the river valley. major landmarks in the town is the Market Cross, or Butter Mart, in the middle of the high street. It's a remarkable hexagonal building where the farmers' wives used to sell dairy products. In theory, it gave them shelter from the sun and prevented the butter from melting. But more commonly, it was shelter from the inclement weather. Built by Thomas Brakes in 1747, it's been used as a town hall, courthouse, a jail and even a fire station. Now it's a roundabout. If you look closely at the weather vane, there are two holes. Allegedly, they're bullet holes, the result of a shooting competition between a soldier and a local gamekeeper.
jewels of Teesdale, just outside the town, surely has to be the Bose Museum. This spectacular building almost takes you by surprise. As you reach the imposing gateway, the building is hidden behind a high wall and is suddenly revealed in all its glory. Designed and built by John and Josephine Bose after the style of a French chateau, it was to become, and still is, a world-class art gallery and a museum. It houses many priceless paintings, including ones by Goya and Canaletto, as well as porcelain and magnificent statues. But its most prominent exhibit is the 240-year-old Silver Swan, a life-size English automaton. Still in working order after nearly two and a half centuries, it performs once a day and is truly a captivating experience. They caught the fish in the second attempt. Right. Um. Leaving Barnard Castle and the Bowes Museum behind, we don't have to travel far before we come to the ruins of Eggleston Abbey. The abbey was founded in 1195, and the building finished in 1198. It was dedicated to St Mary and John the Baptist. It was ravaged by the Warring Scots in 1315 and dissolved in 1540 and subsequently was partly demolished. East of the Abbey, the river takes a gentler pace, and the topography is much more rural, but there are still some significant features to be enjoyed. Near Walton, the Tees is joined by the Greta River, which flows from the south at nearby Greta Bridge with its source high up on the moors at Stainmore. At this point, Teesdale ceases to be a day, as the landscape widens out as we approach Darlington. At Pierce Bridge, the Romans built a bridge over the Tees in the second century to carry the Roman road Deer Street. As they made their way north from York to Hadrian's Wall, the Romans also built a fort here, and the remains of the bridge abutments can still be seen. Surprisingly, the river now takes a more southerly course, and one wonders why Darlington was developed on the River Skern and not on the Tees. South of Darlington and the river meanders its way through Croft and on through Herworth, making huge twists and turns through the mainly flat rural landscape.
Herworth, substantial flood defences have been built to protect the village and housing developments. At Eriholm stands a symbol of the affluent industrial past in the form of a private bridge built by the Victorian engineer Sir Thomas Wrightson, who used it as a shortcut from his grand home to the nearby village church on the opposite side of the river, allowing him and his family to walk to the church for their weekly worship. The Tees doubles back on itself several times over the next few miles through Gersby and Middleton One Row. At the village of Worsall we take to the river and enjoy the wooded peaceful atmosphere as we cruise to the nearby town of Yarm, where the first port on the river was developed. At this point, the Tees became tidal, allowing seagoing sailing vessels to moor and load and unload cargo. From this aerial view, Yarm Town sits on one of the many loops of the river and, as a result, has suffered many floods in its not too distant past. As the snows of winter melted, the river became a torrent, which met a rising tide flowing in the opposite direction. The water had nowhere to go other than bursting its banks. But now, because of flood defences and the Tees barrage downstream, Yarm is a little safer. Where once warehouses and small industries thrived, residential apartments now stand. It also boasts some substantial historical achievements. At the Georgian Dragon in Yarm's High Street, the agreement was signed to build the Stockton to Darlington Railway, the world's first public commercial railway. The rest is, as they say, history and this was the foundation on which the area's world-class industrial heritage was built.
fast forward from 1825 to 2015, and we now start a different journey, from the mouth of the river, where it flows into the cold North Sea, back to Yarm. Like the top of Teesdale, this can also be a wild and windswept place. Our mode of transport will be on a variety of craft, old and new, up the 21st century river, past the many spectacular structures and developments which have evolved over this time. At first glance, this seems to be an ugly, polluted industrial wasteland on the edge of one of Europe's largest petrochemical complexes. But never judge a book by its cover. It's a fascinating and rich environment. And if you like wildlife and ships, then you're in heaven. The Tees was once an ugly, polluted river. But over several decades, it's become once again a pristine environment for migrating birds and seals. Its wide mouth, with mudflats and sand dunes, are home to many species of birds, flowers and rare plants and insects. And pretty much the whole area is designated an SSSI a site of special scientific interest. One of the best places to visit, and most accessible, is South Gare. As the fishermen try to catch fish with rod and line, the crafty grey and harbour seals can quite literally take the fish off the hook. Tees Dock is one of the busiest ports on the North Sea coast of the UK and it sees much traffic plying its way in and out of the river, making the Tees Pilot Cutter one of the busiest boats around. Teesmouth is flanked to the north by the Hartlepool Nuclear Power Station and to the south by the now redundant Red Blast Furnace, which was once one of the largest in Europe. Just offshore is the new wind turbine farm in Tees Bay. But tucked inside the estuary is the charmingly named little harbour of Paddy's Hole, named after the large number of Irishmen who built the South Gare breakwater. When the winter storms blow, Paddy's Hole is a safe haven from the mountainous seas, which can soon build up to six metre swells, and waves can wash over the lighthouse on the end of the Gare. It's a little quieter today. South Gare is almost a community in its own right these days, as fishermen and leisure sailors keep and maintain their boats in the yard, where a collection of huts and cabins are a weekend retreat, and offer the aroma of smoked kippers can fill the air. There's a foundation of a fascinating social history to be told here, but we'll save that for another day. We'll now explore this vast area from the water itself. The scene here, as little as 150 years ago, would have been totally different, as most of the land where this vast chemical and iron and steel industry is built didn't exist. Massive land reclamation took place in the early part of the 20th century, shortly after John Vaughan discovered vast ironstone deposits in the nearby Cleveland Hills. As hundreds of ironworks grew, so did the mountains of slag, the byproduct of iron smelting. The spoil heaps from the mines also became a problem, and over time were used as foundations to reclaim this vast landscape from the sea. There's a fascinating documentary film called A Century in Stone, produced by a local filmmaker, which is essential viewing to get a much more detailed history of this story. As we enter the Seton-on-Tees channel, we come into the Tees National Nature Reserve, where the Greetham Creek flows into this man-made bay. Nearby is the area called Seal Sands, where vast petrochemical processing plants have been developed. But up a little creek, growing numbers of seals choose to socialise and snooze between feeding. The nearby RSPB Saltholm Nature Reserve has built hides all around this area for the public to observe both the seals and the vast variety of migrating birds, which for centuries have used this area to rest up for a while on their vast journeys across the Northern Hemisphere. Continuing our journey, the first major area on the south bank of the Tees is the site of the once thriving iron and steel industry. 
the Redka complex dominated by Europe's largest blast furnace, producing up to 10,000 tonnes of molten iron a day during the late 1970s and well into the 21st century. Sadly, in 2015, the mighty blast furnace was tapped for the last time, and Teesside's iron and steel making legacy came to an end after about 175 years. As we pass the towering unloading cranes, the ore carrying vessels are some of the largest ships to enter the Tees. On the opposite bank, the Hartlepool Nuclear Power Station overlooks the Able UK yard, which specialises in dismantling oil platforms and hazardous ships and marine structures. All along the north bank of the Tees, both chemical and gas storage tank farms dominate the landscape. Interterminals, formerly Simon Storage, being one of the largest. Philips, Greenergy, Fine Organics and several pharmaceutical producers dominate this vast area, while TGPP and British Gas process millions of tonnes of liquid gas, which arrives in pipelines direct from the North Sea. Looking to the South Bank again, and Cleveland Potash Export Terminal stands at the entrance to Tees Dock. Here, steel, container traffic and cars are loaded on and off the vessels, arriving and departing to all parts of the globe. As previously said, the Tees Pilot Cutter is a very busy vessel, conveying the Tees pilots who guide the vast majority of the ships in and out of the river in all weathers and times of the day. With highly volatile cargoes, it's vital to the huge oil tankers and the smaller, but nonetheless volatile, gas and LPG ships dock safely and don't collide or run aground in the swift tidal currents of the busy river. With a plethora of power generation on the Tees, the national grid had to cross this part of the river at some point, resulting in some of the tallest electricity pylons in the UK, enabling the biggest of vessels to pass safely underneath the wires. As we approach the site of Smith's Dock, we pass the shipyard of ANPTs, where small to medium-sized vessels can be repaired in their dry dock. Shipbuilding on the Tees finished in the late 1970s, and this was the site of the last yard to build a major vessel. Smith's Dock nowadays carries out major conversion work and fabrication to specialised oil and gas support and research vessels. and in recent times is frequently host to offshore wind farm construction vessels like the MPV Resolution. This is one of the many new industries to provide work for these high technology marine facilities on the modern river. As we approach the town of Middlesbrough, we pass the ocean-going tugs. These are the workhorses of the river, escorting large vessels, barges, drilling and cable-laying platforms, and basically anything requiring special manoeuvring assistance. On the skyline, the unusual modern art structure of Teminos catches the eye as we enter the old Middlehaven dock. Once a bustling port, which saw massive amounts of cargo arriving and departing our shores, such as railway locomotives from nearby manufacturers, to masses of perishable goods coming in from exotic parts of the world. Now the dock lies empty, and the surrounding land is given over to development as offices and affordable housing and education colleges. The Middlehaven project has witnessed several reincarnations and relaunches in recent years, but progress over the recession-hit area has been slow. But it's been the perfect location for the town's showcase football stadium, the Riverside. Let's hope its fortunes see better days in years to come. As we ease our way ever closer to the town's iconic structure, the Transporter Bridge, 
we pass the rather sorry sight of the half-submerged Tuxedo Royale. This one-time car ferry had a new lease of life as a thriving floating nightclub, permanently moored on the River Tyne under the Tyne Bridge. It was relocated to the Tees when the new tilting Millennium Bridge was constructed to link the Sage Complex in Gateshead with the Quayside in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. The industrial jewel on the river surely has to be the Transporter Bridge. Built by Sir William Arrell and Company and opened in October 1911 by Prince Arthur of Connaught, it links Middlesbrough Town Centre to Port Clarence. There are only two working examples of transporter bridges still existing in the UK. The other one is in Newport, South Wales. Many stories are told of this legendary bridge and its history in a new visitor information centre and museum opened in 2016 on the south side of the bridge. But the heavy industrial landscape doesn't stop here. On the opposite northern bank of the river, the huge fabrication workshops of the Wilton Group at Port Clarence has been the birthplace of many offshore oil platforms and accommodation modules. A short distance further upriver, we see the emerging industry of offshore wind farm manufacturers, TAG, with several transition anchor posts under construction, ready to be shipped from A.V. Dawson's Wharf. We pass the site of Haverton Hill. In the early 20th century, this used to be a thriving shipbuilding yard with many dry docks and slipways. On the skyline, we now see two large waste-to-energy incinerators and a waste recycling plant. We now navigate the Billingham Reach, dredged to allow large ships to access this heavily industrialised area, leading up to the other iconic bridge of the industrial age, the Newport Lifting Bridge. Built in 1934 by Dorman Long, the whole centre section of this bridge lifted to allow cargo vessels in and out of this stretch of the river. It took 12 men to operate and maintain the bridge, but as time moved on, very few ships needed to use this part of the river as industry relocated further downstream. However, it took an Act of Parliament in 1989 to decommission the bridge and declare it as a permanent right-of-way. And in 1990, the bridge was firmly and permanently screwed down, never to rise again. The next part of the river towards Stockton was rerouted in the 19th century to allow large ships to access the wharves in the town, something that's long gone. At about the time the Newport Bridge was closed, construction had started on one of the most significant structures on the river, the Tees Barrage. This was the most revolutionary structure ever to be built on the Tees, allowing the river to maintain a constant level and become non-tidal upstream of this point. This opened up the river and allowed for many developments to take place, particularly the redevelopment of the Stockton-on-Tees riverside area. As we approach the barrage, we pass under the notorious Tees flyover, carrying the A19 trunk road, often closed in high winds, and a major artery of the Teesside highway system. Environmentally, the barrage has made a magnificent difference, as the area upstream became saltwater free, enabling much more control and reintroduction of the fish stocks and wildlife wetland areas. It also allowed much more control over the risk of major flooding, which has taken place many times in the river's history. The difference in the river levels allowed an important recreation and water sports area to be developed, including a world-class artificial whitewater canoe course to be built adjacent to the barrage. To continue our journey up the river, we change from our high-speed rib to a much more sedate and graceful craft a beautiful wooden steamboat. Let's sit back and enjoy this journey as we leave behind the heavy industrial landscape for the brand new developments taking place on this section of revitalised river frontage. To our left, we pass the recently built Stockton College and Durham University complex, linked to the North Shore development area by the graceful lines of the Infinity Bridge.
This area is used extensively by the Stockton Rowing Club, training Olympic hopefuls to follow in the footsteps of their 2012 gold medalist, Kath Copeland. Since the redevelopment of the Stockton-on-Tees River frontage, it's seen frenetic building of new bridges linking these new offices and residential areas with the traditional Stockton-on-Tees town centre, such as the Princess Diana Bridge, linking to the Teesdale development. Before this bridge construction and Tees barrage, the Royal Navy had donated the vessel HMS Kellington, a one-ton class minesweeper, to the Sea Cadets. This being a wooden vessel, over the years it naturally began to deteriorate and was condemned. The final blow came when vandals opened the seacocks and the vessel partially began to sink. So the decision was taken to scrap the vessel in a safe environment. Of course, with the building of all these bridges, this proved impossible and Kellington was eventually dismantled on its moorings, as we can now see looking in a sorry state. All along this stretch of the river, small to medium businesses have been set up, either on the river, like the Teesside Princess dining cruises, or opulent office accommodation onshore. A far cry from its historic industrial heritage, being the terminus of the first public railway from Stockton to Darlington back in 1825. Further on, a replica of Captain Cook's Endeavour is used for outdoor events and functions of all kinds and is overlooked by restaurants and bars as Stockton once again looks towards the river instead of turning its back on what was once an ugly industrial wasteland made famous by Margaret Thatcher's Walk in the Wilderness back in the late 70s. But at the time of recording this, the Endeavour replica is up for sale. Who knows what? its future will be. As we approach the Victoria Bridge, it's hard to imagine that this was where the first road bridge crossed the river. The first stone bridge was built in 1771 and replaced by the present bridge in 1887, built of wrought iron at the staggering cost of £69,051. This is shortly followed by a dramatic new student accommodation building which dominates the skyline. After a short distance we pass under the new and old railway bridges and the bridge carrying the A66 trunk road. From here, we leave behind the built-up areas of Thornaby and Stockton for a more tranquil setting. As the river once more meanders round wildlife meadows and through the floodplain, we take time to enjoy this peaceful stretch of the river and find out a little more about our craft. Right, well, I, I made it, finished it in 2004, starting, started building about 2001, 2002, laid the keel down, built it upside, upside down, 
20 frames spaced out along the keel line and then planked it with cedar strip in a traditional fashion. Then fared it off, uh, glass clothed the outside, turned it over, glass clothed the inside and then fitted it out with sapili which is a, is a very similar wood to, to mahogany. Right, well it's a, it's a vertical fire tube boiler uh, designed to run at 200 pounds per square inch but I run it about 125. It's feeding steam to this engine which is a twin high pressure uh, two and a half inch uh, bore and produces about six and a half seven horsepower. So the boat has a hull speed of about seven or eight mile an hour if we're really pushing it up. At the moment we're doing just short of five mile an hour which is a nice comfortable speed. Are there many other boats similar to this in the country? Uh, there are about four or five others built to a similar design as this, yeah. Yes, it's been going about 30 years now. There are about 250 steamboats up and down the country on the register. Uh, we have about a thousand members. Um, most of us have to build our own boats because you can't really buy them off the peg. So really you need to be a little bit of an engineer because you've probably got to make the engine. Uh, you've got to be capable of sorting out problems in the boilers uh, from time to time. Um, but it's, it's a good association in that we hold a number of rallies up and down the country during the year. Our main rally is held on Windermere during August and it used to be linked in to the Steamboat Museum which unfortunately at the moment is closed, um, hopefully in a few years time to reopen. Are there any old surviving boats with these sort of designs? Yes, oh yes, I mean it's built on traditional styles but there are some boats a hundred years old. I'd like to think this was around in a hundred years, but I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so, cool. so can you tell us a bit about how long it takes to get it up to steam pressure? Well, it, it, it takes about an hour from first lighting the match. I, I tend to cheat a little bit in that I put some charcoal in and a few fire lighters, and they do help to get the coal lit fairly quickly. But just a natural draft up the chimney, which pulls the fire up. This obviously generates the steam. The steam comes into the cylinders and then goes through a, a little trap here which takes out any moisture and any oil and then it puffs up the chimney. And that helps to draw the fire whilst we're, we're steaming along. At the moment I'm injecting water into the boiler, uh, which I have to do about every 10 minutes to replace water that's been used up. Is there an element of competition between steamboat owners to have the better boats or faster boats? I think there is a little bit of that, but not very much, thankfully. Uh, on Windermere, we do have some competitions each year, one of them for the best polished brass. Um, this boat actually won the what's known as Pod's Pot, which was a trophy awarded to the best boat on the rally built in traditional style, in other words it's not made of fiberglass, it's been built by the owner from wood and that the owner's done all the work himself. What were these boats originally designed for? Well Edwardian steamers were, because that was when they were really at their peak in the Edwardian times, they were gentlemen's launches basically and they were used on the Thames quite a lot and across in the Lake District. So and they it, were pleasure boats? They were pleasure boats, them. yes. They were Lots and lots of steamboats, though, used commercially. Um, in the Royal Navy, they had, used to have a lot of naval pinnaces which were steam driven before the advent of uh, petrol and diesel. As we pass through the wooded valley past Preston Park, it's hard to realise that you're so near the largest private housing development in Europe, quite literally over the crest of the hill at Ingleby Barwick. But from the river, all you can see are rolling fields and majestic trees.
As we pass the mouth of the River Leven, we're very near our journey's end, back at the wonderful historic town of Yarth. During the course of this journey, we've spanned two centuries of industrial development witnessed by this remarkable river. From its humble origins high up in the wild moorland of the Pennines, this jewel of a river in the northeast of England makes its way to the equally wild surroundings at Tees Mouth, where it flows into the North Sea. Over millions of years, it's carved its way and created the landscape and has truly evolved from a raindrop to a legend. <laughs> 